Stanford University. Good afternoon. Welcome to EE380. Um, I just realized that Stanford Center for uh, Professional Development has rules about seminar attendance that supposedly you have to ask us before you show up. Uh, consider, our, consider me ask and permission is given to show up for the live uh, class if you are a Stanford Center for Professional Development student. Uh, bring friends too. Um, Computers have traditionally been about sight and sound and some imagination, but people have three other senses. We've been seeing a lot of work in 3D printing and 3D manufacturing, but today's talk is about a somewhat different approach to the 3D world, namely something very akin to 3D rendering. Um, project is known as, is called in some sense claytronics, which I think is clearly a pun on claymation, which, you know, Gumby and Pokey rule. Uh, today's speaker, Todd Mowry, is at Stanford for a year on sabbatical from CMU. Uh, the work he's doing has also had some involvement from Intel, which apparently is not being satisfied with processors and motherboards. So, thank you. Okay. Thanks. So, I'll be talking about uh, this Pro Pario project today, and just quickly, um, so I was actually a EE grad student myself here uh, starting about 20 years ago. Um, then I was professor at the University of Toronto for three years and four winters, as I sometimes counted, counted it there. And then I've been at uh, Carnegie Mellon since then, which also has winters. Um, also, uh, Intel has a research lab at CMU on campus, and a faculty member uh, on a rotating basis uh, runs the lab. So I did that for a couple of years. And this project I'm talking about today is a joint project between uh, a number of us at Carnegie Mellon and researchers at that uh, Intel lab. So it was started by uh, two of us, uh, Seth Goldstein and myself, okay. and then we convinced a lot of other people to join in with us. So the way that this project got started is that I was thinking about um, some ways in which technology has had impact on our everyday lives. So not just technology for technology's sake, but technology to make our lives better somehow. And uh, one, way, one type of technology that's affected how we live is multimedia. So audio and video are very compelling things. If we think about some of our favorite gadgets and things that we want to run out and buy when they come out, there's a good chance that those things have audio and video as part of them. So why is it that we find multimedia so compelling? Okay. I think Part of the reason is that we can directly appreciate um, audio and video with our senses. Yeah. So we don't need some other technology to interpret it for us. And so even somebody who doesn't care about technology can appreciate these things. And what it has allowed us to do, the, the way that it's changed our lives is it's given us this new flexibility over time and space that we all take for granted now. Okay. But just say 200 years ago, if you wanted to have a live conversation with somebody, you actually had to be in the same physical location at the same time to interact with them. But given that we can record and transport um, audio and video very efficiently, we can experience things that are taking place far away. So for example, the presidential inauguration yesterday, we got to watch that even though we're thousands of miles away from where it's happening. And in fact, you can go back today and watch something that happened yesterday, if you'd like, because we can record these things and store them. So that's, that's how it really changed our lives. And also, another thing that's really compelling is not just shipping information, but having uh, live interactions between people that are far away. So using your cell phone to call somebody on uh, uh, some other part of the world and talk to them, that's, that's really changed our lives a lot. Imagine if we couldn't do that. So that would be hard to imagine. So audio and video are great. They've had a big impact on how we live. 
But if we think about the future and what other cool things we could do with technology along these lines, I think the, the important thing, we have to sort of open up our imaginations a little bit and remember that the world that we live in is not just sound and moving images. You know, the world that we live in is this physical 3D world where there are real objects and uh, not just pictures of objects or sounds from objects. So what we're trying to do in this project is um, give this, this power, this amazing power of software control, not just to rendering sound and images, but to rendering arbitrary, moving, physical 3D objects. And when I say render, I mean physically render, not just not create a picture of it or create a hologram, but to actually create a physical object that you could touch. And you can see it move around and interact with it. And if we could do this, I think it would open up a lot of possibilities for some exciting new applications, and I'll tell you a bit about that. Okay, so if we take a step back and think about uh, the technology behind audio and video, what's really going on is we figured out a way to take some physical phenomena that we experience with our senses, like sound or images, and we found a way to capture that. So for example, for sound, we can use a microphone to capture sound waves and turn that into either uh, an analog or a digital representation. And then we can reproduce that using a speaker. <clears throat> so the sound waves that you're hearing out of the speaker are not literally the original sound waves. It's different sound waves. They sound a lot like the original ones. They're close enough that our ears recognize what, it, the, what the sound is and, and it works. <clears throat> And then similarly for video, we can capture photons with a camera and then render them on a onto a screen. Okay, so that's audio and video. And what we're proposing is something that we're calling Pario. And the idea here is to capture and reproduce moving physical 3D objects. So the way that the capture would occur is actually something that's going on already. So a lot of animated movies now are actually uh, created by having actors move around with a lot of cameras around them that are capturing their motion. Not just capturing where they are and how they're moving, it's reconstructing their, their geometry. So that's the basic idea here, which is you have an array of cameras that can reconstruct not only what something looks like, but what its shape is. And then uh, on the other side um, is this new technology that we're working on that will allow you to turn that into something like a moving statue an object that can take on any shape and appearance and motion. Okay, so when audio and video um, were first invented, you know, the people who created these things, I'm sure couldn't have even imagined all of the industries that would come out of these things. And I think similarly, um, if we can make Pario work, it's going to result in some very exciting applications and industries. Okay, so, ah. Let me tell you more about what this picture is supposed to be showing here. So the idea here is imagine a medical student who's trying to learn how to examine an infant. So there's the student and there's the baby. So how could they do this with multimedia? Well, with audio, you could listen to a recording of an infant. But that's not going to be very useful for learning how to examine an infant. Uh, with, with video, you could watch a movie of an infant. But again, you can't really reach out and touch it. Um, you could have a baby doll, but they don't really move or act like real infants. You could have a real infant, but there's probably a limited number of human subjects testing things that you can get your hands on. So what we would have is imagine what you'd like to do is have this physical object that's like an infant. It isn't literally an infant. It's made of some other material. But you can put your hands on it, and it's going to move around uh, just like a real infant. And it's going to be maybe using a lot of mo motion capture data to figure out how to do that. So that's just one sort of contrived example here. OK, so if we zoomed in on this, I already talked a little bit about how the capture occurs, which is that we have an array of cameras that are capturing the appearance and shape of something. Um, what happens on the rendering side? Well, if you zoomed in on this little rendered infant, um, well, first of all, there are probably many different technologies that people might think up that could cause this to work. 
just like there are different technologies for video displays. There's cathode ray tubes, plasma, LCDs, and so on. So we're looking at one particular technology that we call claytronics. And you, you're exactly right, Andy. It's a take on the name uh, claymation. So if you looked, if you zoomed in on this, what you would see is a collection of well, a lot of very small things that look like grains of sand. And each of these is actually a tiny robot. It's a strange kind of robot that I'll tell you about here. So each of these individual ones, they wouldn't exactly look like this, but they might be spherical little robots. And we call each of those a claytronics atom, or a catom for short. So these are our units. We've got lots and lots of these units, and they're all probably the same, more or less. So these um, claytronics atoms, they're real physical objects. And you can think of them as the physical equivalent of a voxel. So they're going to take up, a, they're going to be positioned somewhere in space. They're going to be able to light up a particular color, and you can touch it because it's something that's physically there. And if you took it apart, assuming it really existed, um, what you would find in it is a lot of the things you'd expect in a normal computer system, so processing, memory, networking, all those good things. Um, one thing that's a little different from most uh, computer systems, but that robots have, is that it has a way of moving around or actuating. So somehow these little grains of sand need to be able to uh, attract to each other. They need to stick together, and they need to have some way of moving around each other. And we've been looking at doing this using magnetic and electrostatic forces. <clears throat> and for this whole thing to work, these things are also talking to each other. They're talking to their neighbors and figuring out, OK, the baby's moving now, and we have to wiggle the arm. So we have to change where we are. Let's get together and figure out how we're going to move into the right shape. And I'll tell you uh, a lot more about how we do that. OK. And um, finally, it's not really shown here, but the idea is also that the surface of these things will be a video display. So they get into the right position, and then they light up with the right color. So in that way, we can generate an arbitrary object, uh, given how many of them we have. And they can move around and look like anything, more or less. OK, now if we think about, say, video displays, we didn't start off with HDTV. We started off with fairly low def uh, displays. And the idea in this project is, to, in order to get going, we're actually building models that are where the, the individual atoms or claytronic atoms are much larger than we ultimately want them to be. So here, here's one that I'll tell you about in a, in a minute. So uh, in the near term, these things, the physical resolution won't be very good. But we're just using this as a model to develop the functionality and the software and everything we need so that as we continue to make the unit smaller and this looks like a better, you know, more realistic object, that everything will be ready. So to get started on this, again, we're building these, these larger models of what the, we want these things to be. Um, one other thing that we did to simplify life a little bit is we're starting off, we eliminated one of the dimensions. So rather than trying to start by building spheres and getting them to work, we're building cylinders. So, um, so here are two of them right here. So the idea is I'd have a collection of these things. And if I put them on a surface and look down on them, they should be able to roll around each other uh, and form into some arbitrary shape, or just the projection of a shape. And ultimately, we would build these as spheres, and they can move in three dimensions. It's just that that's harder to do. Uh, when you're making these things by hand with very little money. So this picture is just showing how these things have evolved over time. Our very first prototypes are on the right, and our more recent 2D prototypes are on the left here. And so these have the things I talked about before, processing. We've got around the outside of this, what you have is an array of magnets. So we've got magnets here, electromagnets. So the idea is um, they can attract each other and stick together. And when they want to move, you start changing the polarity of the magnets. So they start repelling each other and attracting each other. And they can move around like that. Um, so there are different slices to these things for things like passing power across each other, driving the magnets, and uh, communicating with infrared so that they can localize each other and figure out who they're, who's next to them. And so I'm actually going to pause this for a second, because this is the point where 
this video doesn't display very nicely in PowerPoint for some reason, so I'm just going to... Oh, well. Actually... Ah, oh, you know, is there an audio plug? I forgot to plug this in. Okay. Sorry about that. So what this is showing, although the for some reason PowerPoint doesn't want to stop. I'm not sure I want to tempt fate here. Okay. Well, what this movie is showing uh, with very low frame rate for some reason is this was an important historical moment in the project because this is the first time that our prototypes did anything useful. So what you're looking at here is we have a surface with alternating layers of metal. And with that we have power and ground. And they, these things have little feet that they're standing on so they can touch power and ground, and that's how they're being powered up. There's no tether otherwise. And they're using their magnets to move around each other. So they're actually strong enough that they can move. OK, so that was our very first prototype. Um, here is a later prototype. Does this connect to uh, sound? No. Is it possible to turn up the audio from the computer somehow? Maybe it's just not working. Okay. Well, anyway, so this is uh, three atoms moving around, and the significance here is that one of them is being handed off to the other ones. So uh, again, you kind of get the idea here that these things Ah, perfect, thanks. So these things roll around each other, and that's how they move. That's how they form into these different shapes. OK, so these are just, um, these are just models of what we eventually want to have. These are really too big for the applications that we have in mind. But in terms of functionality, everything that we want is basically in these already. So they can compute and talk to each other, and they know the basic primitives for moving around. So part of the research is about at least on the hardware side, is um, how do we scale these things down? And I'll be talking more about that. So our goal is to make these things less than a millimeter in diameter. They don't have to be super small. They don't have to be nanometers or anything like that. Um, a millimeter or half a millimeter would be fine. <clears throat> and I'll show you um, some initial prototypes we have of that uh, later. So. One of the things we also want to do is make these things in such a way that they'll be easy to mass produce. Because if you buy some of this material, you'll actually be buying a very, very large number of these little computers. So we want each of them to be very, very cheap so that you can afford to do that. So one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to make the individual units as simple as possible. Our goal is only for the whole collection to work. Individually, if you took one of these things and set it down by itself, it can't do anything. It can't get power, it can't move, or anything interesting. They're only designed to work when you've got a collection of them that are touching each other. And then they're able to collectively move. So each of these also has another interesting thing for a robot is it has no moving parts. The only way that motion occurs is through uh, electromagnetic forces with other robots. And that's how the motion occurs. So that requires this cooperation between things. So, um, so those are some of our design principles here. And one other thing, finally, that I mentioned earlier is the idea is to have a video display on these eventually. And in our prototype so far, we haven't really been worried about that. Um, there are, so ultimately, when they get small enough, if they're, say, a millimeter or smaller, we might be able to just have each one be one particular color at a time, just monochromatic, like a pixel on a screen. And in the near term, if they're larger, maybe we'd have a little organic LED display that we'd wrap around the surface and it would show multiple pic uh, colors at the same time. And if we could do this, then the visual resolution would actually be higher than the physical resolution, which would also be helpful. So to summarize just the concept of what we're trying to do, um, this thing that we call claytronics, um, it is, in fact, the name came from claymation. So if you've ever seen like Wallace or Gromit or claymation movies, what they do is they take one frame at a time and someone goes in and moves something by hand. But it would look very much like that. It's just that in this case, the modeling clay would be moving itself. There's something physically there, but it can actually shape itself and color itself. So that's the concept. OK, so here's what I'll be talking about today. So uh, I've sort of introduced this idea of what Pario is supposed to be. I'm going to first tell you a little bit about what we could do with it. And I'm going to do this in two parts. So first, I'm going to talk about some 
probably far out sounding but slightly less ambitious applications uh, compared to what I'm going to talk about at the end, which is even more ambitious applications. And uh, in between discussing what you can do with this, I'm going to tell you about what we've done so far to make this uh, reality, including uh, software and hardware to make this work. OK, so first I'm going to tell you a bit about some, what you could do with this. OK, so here's a very simple application. It doesn't, a nice interesting thing about it is it doesn't actually require that these things be able to move. It just requires that they be able to talk to each other and stick to each other. So the idea is, imagine that you're um, digging for dinosaur bones somewhere out uh, in the desert. And you find an interesting bone. And you'd like to send a copy of the bone back to the museum so that they can look at it right away. So how can you do this? Well, today, if you're willing to lug a 3D scanner along with you, you could scan it and then send it back. And then they could print it on a 3D printer. But we have perhaps a faster and che maybe cheaper way to do it than that, or certainly something that involves lugging less equipment around. The idea would be, um, so you take your object, and you would just wrap it with little catoms. So you just pour them around it. Now these are actually just BBs. This is just to illustrate the concept. But if you cover this, this object with these things, what they do then is they talk to each other and they figure out where they aren't. So they, they say, where are you? OK, you're here. Let's fill in the space. And there's this void in the middle of us where, there's no, where there aren't any catoms. That must be where the object is. So let's create the, you know, a CAD type of model, a 3D model of what the object is. Then you can just send that electronically to the other side. And on the other side, you just have uh, some of this clay. You transmit the shape to it. And the, the things that are supposed to be part of the shape will bind to each other. And the things that aren't will just remain unattached. And you can just pull them away. So you can do, we call this 3D facts. So you could more or less instantly reproduce, capture and reproduce a physical object in this way. So that's one thing that you might do. You know, this isn't the most compelling thing. I've got other things to talk about that I'm more excited about. OK. so. One thing that I think that would be very interesting with this technology is uh, interactive, hands-on 3D design. So there are many people, architects, doctors, et cetera, um, where they spend all their time really working with 3D objects, so, or engineers. And the way that you deal with a 3D object in a computer is awkward, because inside the computer, there's a, a mathematical model of the 3D uh, structure of this object. But how do you see it and manipulate it? Well, you look at it on a screen. So you have to look at a projection of it. And that's not really three dimensions. That's two dimensions. So to imagine it in three dimensions, sometimes you rotate it so you can imagine in your mind what it must look like in three dimensions. And to, to actually rotate it or do anything, you have to go grab your mouse, you know, select something, and pull it, and so on. Now, maybe you send this through, to a 3D printer. Um, but once you do that, the object is static, and you can't manipulate it or change it uh, directly. What you'd really like to have is just a physical model. So let's say it's an architect, and you you're designing this house. You could just, you know, architects today, they, they take the time to build models with balsa wood and that type of stuff because they're really valuable. So now imagine your model is built out of Claytronics. So now, first of all, you can render it very quickly because you just download the uh, information into it, and it whoosh, forms into this shape. And now if you want to change something, you can just grab a part of it and move it directly. It can sense that you're touching it and pushing on it, just like a touch screen uh, can sense that you're touching something. So, um, so then there wouldn't be this other step of going over to a screen and a keyboard and a mouse. You could just manipulate something directly with your hands. And part of what makes this interesting is if we think about how we do 2D um, how do we do 2D images, for example? We don't usually do it freehand. Instead, we have these toolbars that know how to do things like uh, draw squares and sphere circles and that type of thing. And we can color them and stretch them and everything and stick them together. So imagine all of that now in physical 3D, where I'd say, OK, I want a cube. Uh, now I want it to be a red cube. And now I'm going to stretch it, and I'm going to do something else to it. So it's not only you know, that, that it's going to do a better job than we would do with just modeling clay, 
But these things can also be doing simulations. So for example, if I'm trying to do protein folding, I could build a physical model of the protein, and as I try to bend it, it could be simulating the molecular forces and you know, pushing back or simulating the forces that you might feel if you were actually doing it at the molecular level. Okay, so um, to help people understand, so here's a, I'm gonna start a movie here in a second, but I wanna set this up. So we had difficulty uh, getting people to understand what we were talking about. I would talk to them for say 15 minutes and then they'd stop and say, so it's a hologram? I'd say, no, okay, not getting it at all. So to help people visualize what we're talking about, uh, we, hired, we sponsored this team of uh, master's students at Carnegie Mellon in the entertainment technology uh, master's program to put together a movie to show you what this might look like. Now this is a concept movie and these people were artists and not technology people particularly, uh, but this is how um, car designers might Imagine a technology uh, that lets you create this. objects on the fly. A powerful new medium formed by billions of microscopic so, robots. Each with computation abilities the headlight, and for example. And interaction. Um, when, he, when he grabbed the headlight and pushed it, it didn't just ooze around his finger. It actually maintained the shape of a valid headlight because the, the Claytronics material understood the design rules for headlights. So as you pushed it, it did the right thing. Bring your ideas to the table and let it take shape, form, and color. Rendered dynamically out of captured 3D data, you can now touch it, feel it, mold it in your hands. A programmable matter that transforms your imagination into reality. Playtronics, make it happen. So that's pretty cheesy. Um, <clears throat> they also wrote their own original cheesy music to go with it. But if I told you how little money we paid them, you'd be amazed at what a good job they did. So, <clears throat> so that's one of the ideas, is that engineers could design things by just working with hands-on directly with objects. Um, in a way, to me, it's shocking that after all these years, we still spend all this time using a keyboard and a mouse and a screen, when that's not necessarily the right interface for things. So if we take that idea, and then I think that a way that this might be especially useful is in medicine. So there are many technologies for capturing images of our bodies through things like MRIs, uh, ultrasound, and so on. But again, doctors have the same problem, which is to look at that data, what they get is typically these 2D slices, and they have to, you know, in their heads, imagine what this means in three dimensions. So instead of that, you'd like to render this into a 3D model where they could zoom in, move, you know, remove layers, or whatever they wanted to do. That might be a much uh, more efficient and better way to explore uh, this data about the patient. <clears throat> so the fact that you can zoom in and zoom out, I think, might be very powerful. This is, microscopes are very useful, uh, but rather than just doing this for images, let's do it for physical things. So you can imagine if uh, the surgeons were trying to repair, say, small blood vessels or nerves, they could have a live reproduction of those things at human scale. So the nerves might be look like garden hoses or something. And they could have large tools that they're using to put them back together um, on this model. And that might be capturing what they're doing and transmitting it to a tiny little robotic device that's doing the same thing in your actual body. <clears throat> okay, so that's, so we've talked about two things. I talked about 3D facts and I talked about this hands-on interactive 3D design. Another way in which I think this would be useful is just due to the fact that it can change shapes. So mo for mobility, when I'm running around, I don't want to carry very much stuff with me. I really don't want to have anything larger than, say, my phone. So this is about the size of something I'm willing to carry with me all the time. But a phone is not a nice way to do you know, normal work. It's got a, a little screen and a little keyboard, even if it is a fancy iPhone or something. So what I'd rather have to do real work is something like a real laptop, something with a big screen and a real keyboard that I can work on. So imagine you know, that you have a lump of this material in your pocket, and that's what you carry around. And um, it can maybe work as a phone. Uh, but if you want to do some real work, it stretches itself out into a large but very thin uh, thing that looks a little like a laptop, with a, maybe with a keyboard and a, and a screen. And just to make that, and when you're finished, it could 
squish back down into the smaller object. So just to make that a little more concrete, um, I don't know if you can zoom down on this or whatever, but this is, um, well, actually, it's probably easier if you can zoom in on me holding it. But So this little object is much smaller than anybody's cell phone here. And what this is, is it's just a piece of plastic. But it's th this is the shape of something that, that would have a million uh, millimeter-sized catoms in it, densely packed. So this thing is completely dense. So I'd be happy to carry something like this around. It's fairly small. Now, if I wanted it to be larger than this, it could stretch out into something that would be this size. So it's about that thick now. It looks like an extra super large sized iPhone or something like that. Um, so now this is just two layers thick, and it has some uh, uh, scaffolding inside to help support it. So um, this is just plastic, but this is the real size. So I could go from this to this and then back again. In fact, if I'm fashion conscious, I could have it turn into you know, a bracelet and wear that instead. That might be easier to carry around if I don't have a pocket, for example. So for, for mobile applications, I think that might be very useful. Another area where it might be very useful is for antennas. So the properties of antennas are determined completely by their shape. Um, and there are reasons why it would be nice if our antennas could adapt to different uh, conditions. So we've been doing some initial explorations into using this kind of material um, to change the properties of antennas, and that looks interesting. Okay, so I've told you a bit about things you could do with this. Um, and now I'm going to dive in a little bit into the technology, the research that we've been doing to try to turn this into reality. Yep? Your ideas are, I mean, I, I've heard of things like this similarly before. Your ideas, I think, are interesting for the geometry. But have you given some thought as to the functionality, like in the case of the, the automobile, it has to do more than just geometry. You mean like how strong is it or? No, not so much strength, but things like, um, you know, right now people are really concerned about gas mileage and stuff like that. And geometry does not necessarily help you with gas mileage. Mm -hmm. So do you simulate um, the fluid gas or simulate the battery? <laughs> well, this isn't meant to be a battery or, you know, it's not meant to be um, like a universal material. It's just meant to be something that's useful where it's mostly about shape and appearance. So. Yeah, so it, it's not, uh, it's only some of the Star Trek technology here. Well, not you know, for instance, you, it's interesting you use a car as an example. Since, since all the <coughs> car, one of the things you need is transparency, mm -hmm. or in the case of the, the windows, as an example. Yeah, so to be more clear, we just wanted them to be designing a, a model of a car. I'm not proposing you build an actual car out of this. That would probably be better. Clay model of the car. Right, this is just the clay model of the car, so it's a model. Similarly. For the patient, for the medical case, the material is not uh, organic. It's not alive. It's just a model of it, but it's something that you can explore and manipulate, and that's what it's useful for. So I think, yep. For the medical example, how much of the touch and feel for the doctor actually is heat and slipperiness or wetness, and how much of that do you think you should be able to simulate? I have no idea. Okay, sure. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll tell you a bit what, about what we have done, and then I can, you know, maybe that's useful for answering these other good questions here. So, um, okay, so there are several things that we've been working on. The first is that there are some basic infrastructure plumbing type things that have to work if this is going to work at all. So like power, networking, uh, figuring out where you are in space. Those things all need to work. Um, also, we need to have a way to move these things around efficiently. And people have been worrying about that for robots for a long time, but the number of things we have to move around is really large. Um, so that makes things a little interesting. I'll tell you about that. I'll also talk a little briefly about uh, some programming, language, uh, programming languages that we've developed to help us deal with this challenging programming task. And then finally, I'll talk a bit about the hardware and what we've been doing to build uh, millimeter scale prototypes rather than just these larger models. Okay, so in all of this, a thing that makes it challenging and interesting from a research point of view, oh, and to be clear, I don't know if I was clear enough at the beginning, this isn't a product announcement talk, this is, this is research. This is research that's still in fairly early stages, so this doesn't work yet. 
Um, but uh, we think it's possible that this could work. And, that's, and I'm excited about this. OK, so, um, so scale is interesting. So scale means two things. It means that um, the units are small. And since we want to build life-size things out of them, there are a very, very large number of them. So in a cubic meter of this material, if I have millimeter scale catoms, that means there's a billion of them. I don't necessarily always have a billion, but I probably do have a million of them. So just a cubic, a cubic meter sheet of this is a million of them if they're a millimeter in size. So I have to have algorithms that work on, at the scale of millions to billions. And it's not just the number. To make life even more interesting, they're moving around. And they're probably going to fail non-trivially often, given that they're in fairly harsh uh, physical environments. People are touching them and poking them and so on. OK, so some of the first things we looked at were, as I said, uh, things like power, networking, and localization. So and, and in particular, we started with this power question. And I'm not really going to get into much detail on the second two. I've got backup material if you're interested. But in the interest of time, I'll skip over those a bit. But let me talk about power. So we were worried about this, because if you can't power these things up, then they'll never work. And you can't realistically, you can't expect to put a battery in these things that's going to last for any interesting amount of time, because motion consumes energy fairly quickly. So the idea is not you know, to put little batteries into all of them. They will have some way of storing energy, but we're assuming that that'll only last on the order of seconds to minutes, maybe. So what, what we imagine is that you actually have to have some external power source. So either the thing, the thing is standing on a powered surface where it can get power and route it through itself, like on one of those earlier videos, or maybe it's carrying some type of battery or larger battery or so power source inside of itself. But then the idea is to route paths from power and ground, if it's DC, uh, to all of the nodes. So when they start up, for example, they have to boot up by you know, finding power and ground and then sort of waking up to the point where they can start doing more intelligent things. One of the design decisions that we made by accident um, was that we have, when these things touch each other, it's just basically a piece of metal touching another piece of metal. So we call that a, a unary connector. It's just essentially one wire. Now, uh, experienced roboticists usually, when they build connectors, we found out, they don't build them that way. They build a proper uh, mechanical connector with two electrical connections so you can actually transfer power across it. Because one wire does not allow you to transfer any energy. You need two wires for, to drop voltage across it. So, um, so in order for this to work, you actually have to have two different paths through different, uh, to touch two different of your neighbors, one for power and one for ground. So the idea is, you route from the power source, you have to have at least two, you have to have two of these subgraphs so that everybody gets <clears throat> a connection to power and a connection to ground. Now, the good news though is spheres, when you pack them into 3D space, the ones on the inside have 12 neighbors. So there are a lot of uh, potential connections that you can make. There's a lot of redundancy. And so, um, you know, in theory, it should be uh, feasible to do this in many cases. Um, the interesting part was how simple could we make this algorithm? How, how dumb could it be and still work? So for example, if it could figure out how to power, route power without any cooperation between neighbors, that would be nice. So we experimented with that. And what you're seeing here is the catoms uh, are invisible. There's a, a cube of them. And they're invisible if they're not powered up at all. They turn yellow if there's a, a series parallel connection, which means there's only part of the voltage is dropping across them, which we think is probably enough to power the logic, but not enough to power motion. So in this, uh, in this case on the left, they're just using local measurements of voltage drops to say, oh, it looks like I'm charging up if I use these two nodes as power and ground. Let me do that. Um, and you, doing that, you can actually get a decent number of them to have a series connection, which means they're only getting some fraction of the voltage drop. But if you do just very simple things and have them communicate and figure out where they are in space, you can actually get these higher quality uh, blue connections. These are parallel connections, so you're getting the full voltage drop, which is what you want to have. So anyway, there's a lot more detail on that in papers if you're curious, but the upshot was we decided that 
there was a way to power these things up. They're essentially forming a, a power grid dynamically, and they're changing it over time as they move around. Okay, so that's a taste of some of the infrastructure work that we did. The next thing that we worked on was getting them to move around. So as I said, this is uh, something that robotics people have worried about for a long time. Robotics planning is a, a mature area. But typically, people are only moving relatively small numbers of robots, maybe tens at the most. And we need to move millions of things around. So um, the first interesting idea we had here um, was actually inspired uh, by semiconductor physics. So the idea is, in semiconductors, you think about both electrons and holes. And so this grad student, we gave him this programming challenge. We said, imagine a bar of this material. You start with a, a bar, and you want to have it slowly flex and bend. How would you do that? Well, the first thing that might come to mind is to remove material from one side and move it around to the other side. But that wouldn't look very good. We wanted something better than that. So we thought, well, if I want this thing to have almost fluid properties, it can't be a dense crystal structure, because that can't move. It has to, be, has to have voids in it. So the idea is that you would um, intentionally insert voids or holes into the material. And you can have these voids move around. And what it means for a hole to move is that the robots around it are actually moving around so that it, it moves. So in this picture, um, the robots are moving up and to the right, but the hole's moving down. Uh, and Sorry, they're moving up to the left, and the hole's moving down to the right. So the reason why this is interesting is you can create a lot of these holes and start having them randomly move around. And if a hole hits something, like a surface or another hole, by default it's just going to reflect off of it and keep bouncing around. But what you can do is if you want the surface to grow, you can program, tell the surface that it should create holes and inject them into uh, the material. So now the surface grows as more holes are being inserted. And if you want a particular surface to shrink, you can just tell it to consume a hole. So if a hole happens to strike it, it will just shrink and take the void out of the material. So in this way, we can, there's a way that we can make things grow and shrink. And the reason why this is interesting is that it's very scalable. So locally, at a very small level, we have a small deterministic algorithm for moving a hole. And that only involves a handful of robots at any time. At the highest level, we have to tell the surface whether it should grow or shrink if we want something to get bigger or smaller. But that's relatively, it's relatively efficient to broadcast that information just to the surface. And in between, things are just moving around stochastically. And that's, that's scalable. Now, the downside is that we have limited control over how the stochastic process unfolds. We're just hoping through things like the law of large numbers that eventually the right things will happen. Um, so this is a little bit more like chemistry. You know, with chemistry, you pour things together and you mix them and the right thing happens because you've got enough of your molecules there. So um, as another uh, example of this, here we have something that's both shrinking and growing. So it started as a square and we wanted it to turn into something like an inverted V. So at the top, it's consuming holes and at the bottom, it's uh, creating holes. Biology microtubules do that. Huh. You should check. Is that they basically sh change shapes uh -huh. by moving from one to the other, huh. okay. destructing on one end, constructing on the other. Huh. Great. After it's a, li a linear object in this uh -huh. sense. Huh. Tube. Like like a carbon nanotube, but okay. more complicated. Huh. Yeah, thanks. After they can grow, grow and shrink. Huh. Neat. So that's, that's what happens in sort of at the, at the larger scale, which is, you know, if you zoom out, you see things growing and shrinking. If you look at a very small scale, what's happening is a lot of local coordination that's going on. So this is just a visualization of some of the algorithms that are running at a low level where they're constructing little spanning trees and electing leaders and moving around and doing that type of thing. But the thing that we liked about this is that this is a scale, this is a way that we could imagine programming billions of nodes and it might actually work. Um, but there are some downsides to this. So holes aren't the most uh, intuitive things to work with. And the stochastic nature of this means that we don't know how quickly things will 
always move. So our, the next step that we took was we thought, OK, the big takeaway message from that was that voids are important. It's not just where the robots are, it's where they aren't. And that's just as important. So, but rather than thinking about one hole, what if we thought about an object? And, uh, but this object is bigger than one robot. It's actually as big as some collection of them. And we call this uh, object a meta module. And this will be our unit of motion. And what we want to do is have, this, have these meta modules have these special properties. So it's inspired a little bit by sculpting. So if I think about sculpting, if I'm starting with this, an object that looks like this, I might decide that I want to grow it in a particular area. Maybe I add more material there. And maybe I want to shrink it here, and I want that to go away. Now, with real sculpting, you push more clay onto it, or you scrape it away. But we wanted to do this all internally. But the point is, you're always starting by deleting or adding something relative to the existing surface. So the idea was, I could def build a meta module, and it could either be almost entirely full or almost entirely empty. If it's, and the ones that are full, we call creators because they contain enough material that they can actually spit out another meta module, something that has the outer structure of it. And the ones that are mostly empty, we call destroyers because neighboring destroyers can actually pull one neighbor inside of the other one. So now the idea is we have this almost magical property where we can just create and destroy material um, assuming that we put the right sets of creators and destroyers in the right place at the right time. So from the point of view of a planning algorithm, this makes life very nice because one of the problems with planning is that things look like they're easy to manipulate. It looks like things are almost in the right position, but they get stuck. And with this property, things uh, don't get stuck anymore. And there's, now there's still this lower level operation of balancing, moving the right material into the right place at the right time, and we have to worry about that. But um, we, another nice thing about this is we're able to actually prove things about our planner. Using a very simple heuristic planner, we can prove that it will get into the right shape um, in a bounded amount of time. And this is just a video showing uh, us using this planner to transform a cube of material into something that's, uh, that looks like a trumpet. So that's what the motion planning looks like. That's a very, very simple heuristic planner underneath that. Okay, so then those are two things that we've done for doing motion planning, and they both work uh, within a lattice structure. So if, if we take space and say, okay, if I pack spheres into uh, three dimensions, you know, there, there are these certain grid positions, and we can think about whether something's either in position or not. So that's useful for many things, but sometimes we want to do motions that are, that are not um, within a lattice. So maybe we want to build muscles or other things that can bend and twist in, in unusual, you know, continuous ways, not just lattice motions. So how would we do that? So the idea is, again, we're going to start with a, a group of things, a group of robots. And in this, the idea here is if I took, for, in two dimensions, if I take eight robots and sort of stuck them together, they could either change their aspect ratio to be very tall and skinny or very wide and flat. And they could imagine being anywhere in between. So that would be one unit. Now imagine taking a number of these things and putting them next to each other. And I can individually control the aspect ratios of each of them. And if I can do that, I can create motions like this. Or now you can have something kind of stretching out and bending continuously and having much more interesting motions. And this is a little bit like a child's toy made out of plastic where you can stretch something out and bend it and warp it around. So we think that this is a way that we might, uh, we also have a 3D version of this that works. So we think this is a way to build things like muscles and other interesting structures. And we've done other, some other work in, in that space, but I, uh, in the interest of time, I'll move on and talk about the next thing, which is programming languages. So <clears throat> these, uh, so we're worried, about, we're worried about the programming task for programming these things because they have to do a lot of things. And um, so they are routing power, they are moving, they're communicating, they're doing a lot of things. And this is um, a distributed programming problem. Distributed programming is challenging and things are gonna be failing a lot. 
So if you tried to write low-level you know, C code to make this work, um, that might be hard. So the approach that we're looking at is uh, a declarative approach. So a very crude analogy is if you think about databases, um, people interact with databases using uh, SQL, which is this, this declarative language where you just say something fairly concise, and that gets translated into this huge mechanism inside the database management system that makes everything actually work. But the programmer says something that's fairly succinct. So we'd like to have that same property here. We like to just say, OK, here's a rule. Add that into my system. Um, for example, you must always maintain uh, a graph to ground and a graph to power. So there's no way you're allowed to not do that. And for structural integrity, here's another set of rules for that. So we'd like to just insert rules into our system and have it synthesize all of the low-level code that will make that actually happen. And part of the reason why we want to do it that way is that, we want, is, is that we need to modify the system. If you want to change something, that's when things tend to fall apart. If I go, oops, uh, I, I changed this little thing, but suddenly uh, these seven other things don't work anymore because I didn't think of them originally when I wrote the code. So <clears throat> we've been looking at, we've worked out uh, two different programming languages. So the first one is called, um, we call it locally distributed predicates, and it's based on this paradigm of pattern matching. And the second one we call meld, and it's more like prolog. So the first one of these, which we call locally distributed predicates, or LDP, this actually began when we were trying to do debugging, because we discovered that all the interesting bugs involve multiple robots. It's not just the state of one particular robot, it's that its state relative, relative to its neighbors, that was what caused the problem. And it's very hard to set a watch point across a set of things. It's easy to do it locally, but it's harder to do it in a distributed way. So the idea is we wanted to be able to, this is a very contr simple contrived example here, where imagine that the problem that I'm looking for is that it's bad for some reason if nodes that have state one are right next to nodes with state three. So imagine that that's the bug that I want to look for. So the idea is we, we're gonna say, okay, look across all the robots, and we have this list, A and B, and those just refer to neighboring robots. So they're direct neighbors, A and B. And what we wanna look for is that A has a value of one and B has a value of three. And if so, then there's something else we wanna do, like uh, you know, take an action. Uh, so, okay, so that's the, what we might wanna specify. And it would go off and find these three things and then take some action there, like color them a certain color or make something move or whatever. Now what's happening under, underneath the covers here is we start off with this piece of code and we compile that into a pattern matching structure. So the idea is a brute force way to do this would be on every time step you would go look everywhere and see if all these conditions were true and you'd be, end up communicating a lot of information across the nodes and we don't want to do that. So the idea is we decompose this into something where each node gets a piece of the pattern and it locally sees whether it matches part of it. And if it does, and if only if it does, it will then pass information to its other neighbors. So for example, if I have a node that's in this particular case that has a value one, it'll say, oh, I've matched this part of the, the sub pattern. I should tell my neighbors about this because if they have a three, then we found this. So it'll ship information to its two neighbors. This one discovers, well, my value is one and not three, so it's okay, but this one, says, ah, it is three, so da -da, now we want to take the action. So that's, um, okay, so that's LDP. And what you see in this movie, um, I apologize because on the display you can't read the code, uh, but that's the entire source code for the meta module planner um, for this. And what it's doing is changing shape from a structure that's sort of lying down into a more vertical structure. So the take home message is just that that's a fairly small amount of code to do something that's quite complicated. Okay, so that's one of the languages that we looked at um, that we are sort of working on. The other one was, is something more like prologue. So the previous one is based on pattern matching where ev at every instant in time you try to match, match these patterns and then take an action if you see the pattern. Um, the, the second language, in prologue you have a set of rules 
And the rules take some base facts and they derive new facts given those rules. Okay, so what you can do is you can actually make robots move around using this kind of idea. And people have done this with Prolog already. We actually took a variant of this uh, from a language at Berkeley called P2 that they were using to program distributed uh, overlay networks. So, and we added more to it. So if you wanted to have three robots walk over to a particular place, you could have this code here on the left where they compute distances, figure out who's further away, and then one moves around the other one if it's, if it's the one that's further away. And then that would cause them to walk over to the right place. So that's just a little toy example. Okay, now the version on the left is the meld code to do this, and that's just three little lines of code. And to write the equivalent of code in C++, it turns into several pages of code typically. And then so the hope is that it's easier to wrap your head around less code and to modify it and not break things than it is to wrap your head around a whole lot of code. And uh, the runtime system and the compiler for MELD are doing a lot of the heavy lifting, so doing things that you don't have to think about. The other thing to notice is that you, you don't actually really think about concurrency in this case. You do think, you talk about neighbors and what they're supposed to do, but you don't have to deal with a lot of the data races and other things you have to worry about in traditional parallel programming. And then here's just another um, toy example showing that if I wanted a group of robots to run to a light source, I can write a sort of one line piece of code uh, to do something like that. Okay, so we've been working on ways to move the robots around and we've been working on some programming language support. Now I'm gonna talk about is a little more about the hardware. So this is a double E seminar, so let's talk more about hardware. Oh, and there are two things I'm gonna discuss. The first one is that in these original models that we've been building so far, we've actually been using electromagnets to do the motion. Um, but what we imagine is that when we go down to a millimeter scale, magnets won't be very attractive at that scale. It's hard to manufacture them and they're heavy and we think that electrostatic forces will actually be a lot more attractive at a millimeter scale. So the idea is, you know, rather than having electro, you know, magnetic fields, what you effectively do is build a capacitor across two neighboring robots and that allows them to attract each other. And then you can control the charge uh, through other paths and discharge the capacitor so that they'll release. They're doing MEMS. Right. So, and we're you, I'll show some MEMS stuff in a minute here. So, okay, so the first step is we were trying to think about how could we have really good electrostatic uh, actuation where first we just want things to stick together. We want to have a, a electrical way to make things stick together very, very strongly. And this is still at a macro scale, but you know, one design decision is whether you want to have rigid plates or flexible plates. So we decided flexible plates are much more attractive and for the, re the following reason, which is I can get them to conform to each other and have very little space between the plates. Whereas the rigid ones, it's hard to get them to really conform perfectly to each other and then I'm gonna lose some of my forces. So we like flexible ones to work and we attempted to build a model of this. Now, the thing is at a millimeter scale, given the thickness of these things that we imagine building with MEMS technology and uh, their mass, they're actually much lighter given their surface than these things. In order to simulate something that was that light uh, what we actually did was we built uh, helium-filled balloons. So our joke was that we were scaling, but now it's in the wrong direction. So those are people standing there um, underneath these things. So these are a uh, couple meters in diameter. So we inflated them with helium, so we thought that they had about the right you know, ratio of weight to surface area. And then we had these uh, flexible flaps that we were using to get them to attract each other and then move together. Well, that was the idea, but it didn't work. Uh, we learned something useful from why this didn't work. And the problem was peeling. So this is the reason why you can unroll scotch tape. So uh, in theory, there's really good force between these things, but if you just go to the edge and start pulling it apart, it's very easy to peel them apart, and then suddenly it doesn't work. So what we wanted to do is 
We, so we did a new design that doesn't have that problem, there's a short story. So if you, if you have the flaps going like teeth that, that fit together rather than going like this, then they just have shear forces and they don't peel anymore. So uh, we're able to build uh, some electrostatic latches this way that work very well. So using just a simple, a little battery, we can charge up two of these things, remove the battery, and you, will, you cannot pull them apart. They're, they're very, very strong. And then we can just electrically discharge them and then they come apart easily. So this is, this is us trying to explore how to have good electrostatic latches, still at a macro scale. But our real goal is to get down to a micro scale. And that's what, um, this is showing one of, our, one of the things that we're doing here. So again, we're playing this trick of reducing, eliminating one of the dimensions. So we're not building a sphere yet in this picture. I'll show you spheres in a couple slides. We have a tube, and what we want to do is move it, actuate it, not just get it to uh, stick to something, but to actually move. So what you see here is this thing is um, a couple millimeters in diameter, and it's just a simple metal tube. And then you have, we've interleaved some wires, and we're controlling the uh, voltage on these different things so that we're basically forming a capacitor through the wires and the tube and then by playing with the, the voltages on these things, we can actually move it. And so that's just a, that was just a very simple baby step toward what we want. So in that p figure, what you saw is a passive tube on an intelligent substrate. What we really want is an intelligent tube. And actually, we really want a sphere, but it's the same idea. So what we've built now, and I've got some of our first ones back here. We don't have all the parts yet we don't have the control chip for the inside yet, is you actually fabricate um, electrodes around the surface of the tube, and then you control that, and then you can do an exact analog of the ex experiment, but you do it backwards. Now the tube is actually controlling the voltages on its electrodes, and it can move itself that way. So that's the next baby step here. <clears throat> and we uh, do this using MEMS, so we fabricate this as a flat thing, and then it releases and rolls up into a tube. And then uh, we've also done some lots of simulations to verify that this idea should work. So, so okay. So we think that we can use electrostatics to make these things move. But so far, I haven't been showing. I've only been showing you tubes. How are we going to build spheres? That's what we really want. So we like to use just normal MEMS, conventional MEMS technology. But one of the challenges is that MEMS is kind of fundamentally a 2D process and building layers on top of something. And we want 3D, you know, we want spheres and big 3D structures. So we've come up with two different ways to do this. Um, the first idea was from Rob Reed, who we uh, have been collaborating with at the Air Force Research Lab. And his observation was that <clears throat> when silicon is, you know, when silicon is thin enough, it's actually flexible. And what you can do is if you start with a silicon on insulator wafer, Oh, well, one of the problems with MEMS, a challenge, is that if you build a thin structure, it tends to warp. It wants to bend, unless you get the doping just right. But if you want it to warp, that's easy to do. You can actually cause it to warp. So the idea is you pattern something onto the surface here, and you imagine putting the circuitry and things on the inside. And then when you release it from the silicon dioxide, it will actually fold up into a spherical shape. So an analogy is, when you, if you ever buy a, a globe, there's paper on the surface of the globe. And that wasn't printed in 3D, it was printed in 2D. So there's a, a 2D shape that it then gets folded up onto the surface of the globe. It's not shown that way here, but that's the idea. So this was his very, one of his very first uh, proof of concept experiments. He didn't completely release it, but he showed that he could, uh, this is 100 microns here, and he could create these little arms and get them to fold up. Um, and then, you know, this is a, another design. So you imagine having a capacitor that you stick in here and maybe a solar cell, and then this thing wraps up into a tube uh, when it gets released. But this is a, a picture on a microscope of a more recent thing that he fabricated. Uh, and this is changing the focal depth on, on the structure. So this looks much more like a good sphere. And then finally, what this is showing is an experiment exactly like the one I showed you a couple of slides ago, where you've got 
Uh, in this case, though, we're moving a sphere around. So it's sitting on these wires, and by controlling the voltages across these different wires, we can manipulate the sphere. So the idea is to do exactly this, but to put all the smarts onto the sphere itself so that it has individual electrodes and it can move itself relative to its neighbors. So that's one way to do this, which is to build a, a shape and have it fold up into a sphere. But we have another approach um, that a uh, collaborator at Intel came up with, which was to actually just make two hemispheres and stick them together. So the idea is you start by etching out a hemispheric mold. You then pattern the electrodes into the surface inside of that mold, and then fill it with something, maybe glass. <clears throat> And now you have a, a hemisphere, <clears throat> and then you maybe use a, a different process to make two, uh, to make some disks. Maybe you've got the processing on one of these and the, the power uh, stuff on the, another one, and then you can sort of bond all this stuff together and release it. So that's the, that's the theory. So um, this way we might get, um, we might be able to mass produce these things. And, um, <clears throat> If they were 0.6 millimeters in diameter, we would have about you know, 226,000 of them on a 300 millimeter wafer. If they were smaller, if they were 200 mic uh, micrometers, uh, we would have 2 million of them. So, and this isn't just uh, a theory. Uh, so he actually did experiments where he built these molds uh, and built these glass spheres. And I actually have some of them here. So I can't really see them from where you're sitting, but you can come up and take a look at these if you like. So, so we think that there are ways to mass produce um, these objects and to put all the functionality in them that we need. So there are many more steps to really make this happen, uh, but it looks like this is possible. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly what we imagined is you would release them and the ones that worked would crawl out. Uh, and the ones that didn't work would just sit there and we'd pfft, recycle them. So, yeah. Approximately how much, I, I realize it depends on how, how they space themselves, but you sort of have an understanding for sort of the maximum spacing. How much volume do you get off of a 300 millimeter uh, thing? Because that sort mm -hmm. of tells you your cost, because we know what a wafer costs. The fat. <clears throat> so, mm -hmm. what's this in cubic centimeters, dollars per cubic centimeter? Mm -hmm. um, well, it's about, um, if they were small, it's about this big, basically. So, which can turn into something this big if it's hollow. So that's about, that's about the size. That's why we chose these. From a wafer. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Something like that. So, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, so, uh, so medical applications, I think, might be some of the good early adopter applications where um, you know, people are perhaps willing to pay a little more for an instrument that would be reused you know, in important situations. Eventually, there are consumer applications of this that I'm about to get to that I think would drive the cost down a lot, like DVD players or something. <clears throat> so, okay. So uh, I've talked a bit about the technology. So we have a path for building the hardware, and we have built, put together some key pieces of the software. And so what else could we do with this? So now I'm going to actually reveal to you the real reason why I started the project. And I have learned to keep this to the end, because people uh, will usually laugh and leave the room if they hear it at the beginning. OK, so, um, okay. so remote interaction, I talked to you before about uh, phones and how we can call people who are far away and how this is really a powerful thing and it changes our lives. But remote interaction is not perfect. So the fact is we, we travel a lot to have face-to-face -face meetings. So why do we do business travel? Uh, why don't we just call people instead? You know, why are these freeways clogged with cars? Because people are going to work. Why are they going to work? Why aren't they just telecommuting? So these look like happy telecommuters. Why aren't we all just happy telecommuters. Actually, many of you apparently are, because this room isn't full. Um, and the answer is that um, there's real value in face-to-face -face interaction, and that's why we bothered to do this. And in fact, there are people who can't do their jobs just over the phone. If you're a paramedic or a tennis instructor, you really need to be 
there physically. You need to have some physical presence. So what this says to me is that there's room for improving our remote interaction technologies. So what I'd like to do is you know, pass this new type of Turing test, not for intelligence, but for high fidelity remote interaction. I want to make remote interaction so good that you just really can't tell the difference between actually being there and uh, doing it remotely. And a th key thing about that is it's not just about the people. It's about their environment. If you are remotely interacting with somebody who's in their own office and you're in a completely different office, it doesn't work. You actually have to have the same furniture and all the same things if you're going to work together in 3D space like you're really in the same place. Okay, so you might say, well, we've got video conferencing. Why isn't that the answer? Why don't we make video conferencing really, really, really good and then that'll just do it? And my answer to that is, to me, it's a little bit like visiting somebody in prison. Because even if we have the most beautiful video quality and really giant, huge, wonderful displays, there's still this glass wall that separates you from the other person. And you know that you can never pass anything through that wall, like the birthday cake with a file in it or whatever. So you need to really be able to move around in physical space for this to feel natural. And in fact, when you add in many more people, this starts to feel more and more awkward. So if I call up you know, 16 of my friends, this doesn't feel anything like 16 of us sitting in a room together. So then the next thing that I was actually thinking about was maybe the answer is augmented reality. So maybe I wear some goggles, a head-mounted display, and I can see where I am, but I can also see friends here who aren't actually there. And when I thought about that for a while, I decided there were a couple of problems with that. So the first one is um, all of the things that would be added to my environment aren't physically there. Now, when people have talked about augmented reality applications so far, usually you're using the computer to highlight something with maybe a neon color or add text or other things where it's obvious that what the computer added isn't really there. But what I want to do is just create everyday objects, and I want them to be photorealistic, things like chairs and tables and so on. And now the problem is if I walk up to this table and set my laptop on it and then discover that it's not really there and my laptop crashes on the ground, or and then I sit in the chair and it's not there either and I fall down, I'm not going to be very happy with this technology. I'm going to shut it off and I won't want to use it. So there has to be something physically there. Or there has to be some way to deal with that. I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Well, and I'll actually talk about it now. So um, that is useful for some things, but it still doesn't solve the laptop on a table that's not there the problem. Not real we, we okay, I'll get to that then in two, two slides. Okay. Okay, another issue with uh, head-mounted displays is that, that they're fun for, you know, 20 minutes, but they're not fun all day. Uh, they tend to make, give you motion sickness because they mess with your inner ear a little bit because the latency and everything isn't quite what you expect. So it's not fun to be uh, nauseous. And then the other, the other uh, you know, extreme was, well, some people say the right thing to do is just override all of your senses. You know, if I could override my sense of touch and everything, then I could create this perfect illusion that you're somewhere, uh, even if you really aren't. And this is probably just a matter of personal taste, but I really don't like that scenario. I don't want to be wearing my Spider-Man suit and my goggles and having, you know, like the movie The Matrix where something just plugs right into my brain and I'm just dreaming all the time. I don't find, I don't really want that. Uh, instead, what I want to do is just use my senses normally in a real physical environment. It's simply that I want some of the things that are in the environment to be software controlled, but they're real objects. Okay, so. So con in contrast with the graphics approach, the way that, that graphics or augmented reality deals with something is if I want to have a 3D object, I render it into an image and I interpose that between my eyeball and where the object's supposed to be. But instead, let's just build the object uh, physically. And this solves these problems because now there's something physically there. There is something where the table's supposed to be and where the chair's supposed to be. Now, I may still be surprised when I touch it because it may look like wood, but it's going to feel like plastic or metal. But that's a better surprise than there being nothing there. It solves the um, motion sickness problem because when I move around, um, there's no latency lag or anything. I will see the object where it's supposed to be, and my, my head won't get upset about that. And I don't need any special gear. 
to appreciate this. If somebody forgot to bring their head-mounted display and their Spider-Man glove today, they can still participate because they don't need that stuff. So if you wanted to have remote interaction, this is a cartoonish version of this, but imagine that you and two of your friends in different cities want to get together and uh, aerobicize, I guess. Sorry about the simple clip art here. So what you would do is you call them up, just like you might do on Skype or something else. You know, you have an incoming call, confirm that this is your friend and you do want to interact with them, and then you establish this connection. And then what happens is that everything in your space is captured using a camera array, and it knows where all the objects are, you and everything else. It communicates this to the other sites um, and vice versa. And now using this material, we're going to create a replica of all the objects from the other spaces into your space. The very first thing you do is make sure that there aren't any collisions. If there are, you have, you have an error message and you have to move things around out of the way to get this going. But once it's set up, whenever a real object like you moves in one of the spaces, your replica will move in the other spaces and vice versa. And if you think about it for a little while, this actually will create a fairly believable illusion that you are in the same space. And in fact, for sound, this is exactly what happens if you call somebody on speaker phones. So from the audio is replicated in both of the spaces by simply taking your sounds and copying them there and vice versa. From a sound point of view, it's like you're in the same room. OK, so what would we do with this other than aerobicizing? Well, one thing is, hopefully, you know, you go on fewer business trips. Maybe that's bad for the airline industry, but uh, maybe it's good for the environment. Uh, probably what you would do is rather you could make every meeting with someone who's far away essentially into a face-to-face -face meeting. So don't, I'll just come over uh, right away. And in fact, experts, people like doctors, paramedics, or other experts could all make house calls again because you can have a physical presence somewhere instantly. Just like how today we can have a voice presence anywhere by phoning somebody up. We can talk to them now, but now you can have some type of physical presence there. So you might imagine that uh, if you call 911, a paramedic might be able to capture you know, your state and project their state into your space and do some things to uh, help a patient. So if somebody's gone into cardiac arrest, maybe someone can come and do CPR or something like that instantly. And that's important in things like heart attacks where the time to treatment is critical. OK. Now, of course, uh, now. So that's, uh, so remote interaction is one thing. That's like cell phone calls on steroids. Now, what would, what would movies and home entertainment uh, be like in this scenario? So if you think about running something from Netflix and playing it on your Claytronics player, what happens now? Well, in some sense, this is a little bit like combining a movie and a play. So like a play, things would actually be materialized in front of you. So there would be actors, um, they're made out of claytronics, and scenery and everything, and they'd be moving around. Now plays are compelling because there's something in front of you, but usually in a play it's people talking in a room and there's not much exciting scenery and special effects. But with this you could have exciting visual special effects and all those fancy things from movies because we can uh, render that stuff uh, using the equivalent of computer animation. Uh, in 3D. And you could, do, you could imagine things like taking home movies of a child's first steps and then actually seeing you know, that from different angles and seeing a little robot of the child. It looks just like it walking around. Um, then the other, the other thing about movies is the reason I rarely watch a movie more than once is it's exactly the same experience the second time you watch it. You can turn on the director's comments if you want, but um, if you had the control of a particular character or something like that. Okay, I think I'm out of time here. So um, to wrap this up, uh, when we started this project about five years ago, I originally thought that this was probably impossible for some very good reasons, you know, the laws of physics or thermodynamics or something. Um, but we made a whole lot of progress, um, and in many ways, uh, better progress than we thought we would make. So this does seem to be very possible. And in fact, we think that our current design for building the hardware will really work. And the software seems to work. So although people laugh when I tell them about this, I think this, there's no good reason why this couldn't be a product in about, say, 10 to 15 years if we 
invested in uh, the engineering part of this. And I think that the applications you know, that, that I've talked about are very exciting. They're more exciting than what we can do with our, you know, with limitations of just audio and video. Uh, scale is one of the big research challenges. So how do we make millimeter scale hardware and how do we write software to control millions to billions of little robots? And part of what makes this really fun for me is how interdisciplinary this is because it's bringing together uh, people from MEMS and AI and lots and lots of different areas. So this is a big challenge. We're, we're not able to do all this ourselves. So if this excites you, we are always looking for more people to collaborate with. So thanks. That's that's all I've got. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.